Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of 10 Minute Philosophy. Today I will be discussing the effects of materialism and consumerism on society, as well as man's search for meaning. And no, I don't mean Viktor Frankl's book, I just mean man's general, deeper search for understanding and a reason for our existence, as well as the human nature in gravitating towards power, which is very much related to man's search for meaning. Now, life in general is full of suffering, regardless if you live in a developing country or a developed country. Now, in developing countries, oftentimes, suffering is more physical. It's related to, for example, famine, disease, warfare, unemployment, the kind of issues that you can generally solve on a physical level. Now, oftentimes, it's interesting that developing countries' uh, average level of happiness is sometimes higher than that of developed countries. And why is that? Why is that that the countries with less are often more happy than those countries with more, right? So it's kind of this odd dichotomy. And I think that it is a direct result of societies that have grown materialistic, uh, essentially consumer societies, and how that sort of leads to this void, uh, this lack of meaning, because once all your basic um, necessities for survival are attained, you lose this very basic human purpose. And the fundamental human purpose at its core is to survive and procreate. So if you look at countries with less, potentially, uh, maybe they don't have as much uh, comforts, as much commodities, they're often happier because their purpose uh, of attending to their basic needs of survival, providing food for their families, um, living in, in relatively basic living conditions, but also having very basic goals, physical goals um, that they have to work hard to accomplish, but at the same time, their life is fully dedicated to accomplishing these tasks to keep their family fed, keep their family safe. Therefore, a lot of times they're happier because although they have less, their mission in life is simple, provide for their family, survive, right? Now, obviously, if, if you have a developing country with warfare, then this kind of goes out the window. Obviously, people need safety. They need to be able to have a livelihood and survive. But I'm talking more like countries that are relatively peaceful, but generally suffer from perhaps higher rates of unemployment, um, lower income, lower living conditions, and why they seem to be happier. Now, I do believe that this is a direct result of the sort of dichotomy of why people in developed countries, materialistic countries, consumer societies are often less happy than those in developing countries. It's a dichotomy because it's interesting. You expect that if you have more, if you have more access to pleasures, to different commodities, to different comforts, uh, then you expect to be happier, but it's not the case. It's a, this, this sort of odd relationship, right? And I'm going to be delving into that, why materialism leads to this sort of void, this void of once you attain a certain level of survival, once you've met all those basic survival needs, and not only meet them, but meet them easily, where it becomes easy to do all those things. It becomes easy to feed your family to a certain degree. It becomes easy to provide them with a roof over their heads. And obviously it's not the case um, for everyone in developed countries, but for the most part, developed countries have a high middle class. So this generally is the trend. Um, and why in, in this sort of relationship between materialism, uh, consumption of, of, of these goods that we don't really need, um, these things that give us instant gratification that don't just fulfill our basic needs for survival, why this creates a sort of void. Now, it, it kind of goes back, and I, I like to go back to this time and time again, Arthur Schopenhauer's will to life. Now, that will to life is centered around procreation and survival. So why humans are always striving for more, why they can't seem to be satisfied, right? And, and the answer is, is quite simple, and it's because in the state of nature, survival is very difficult, right? So generally, very early meaning, and I have tiers of human value that I want to go into, tiers of human meaning, and at the bottom of the most, like, the most instant you need that from the get-go is survival. So that's, you know, food, shelter, um, and all those things, keeping your family safe, 
right? So that's, that's the basic human drive is to procreate and to survive. Therefore, meaning becomes very simple. It's all centered around survival. And when you're put into these situations where you need to survive, then your body's being fully stimulated, your mind's being fully stimulated, you're fully focused on the task that humans were evolution-wise uh, bred or evolved to, to meet, the task that we, we were meant to accomplish, which is survival and procreation. So in developed countries where survival is a lot easier, where generally access to jobs are, are more readily available, and especially jobs that aren't necessarily labor intensive. Uh, a lot of them are nine to five office jobs. You're sitting down for most of the day. Um, they're more they're more mentally taxing rather than physically taxing. Uh, and and why in these in these developed countries with with sort of sufficient you know your basic needs for survival are not only met but exceeded. Um, you start to see uh, a variation of human value. So it starts off with survival in this little tier list I made. Now what comes after that is pleasure. Uh, so comforts, pleasures, um, receiving dopamine, right? So for example, in consumer societies, we have a lot more access to entertainment. Uh, you have movie theaters, you have a lot of, you know, pop culture, uh, music, uh, other forms of media. And in consumer societies, materialistic developed countries, uh, you have you have a very much a need for these things in a sense. Now, maybe we don't need them from a survival standpoint, but once survival is met, people seek pleasure uh, because human beings are never fully satisfied, like the will to life. They're constantly striving for more. So once survival is met, then your body wants, you want to receive pleasure because if you take like a caveman, for example, way back, right? If a caveman saw uh, like a, a whole gallon tub of ice cream he'd eat it right away now he eats it because evolutionary evolution wise his body tells him you need to get as many calories as possible whenever you can because you never know when your next meal is going to come therefore uh in the modern world when we see ice cream we want to eat it because it goes back to our very basic necessity to consume calories because we don't know when our next meal is coming and this manifests itself in searching for pleasure. All these different things, which originally are just basic needs for survival, are hijacked because our bodies aren't quite sure that we have met our survival needs. We want more and more and more. So you take uh, procreation, for example. Why Now, most animals uh, only have sex to, to procreate, right? But humans are one of the the, I don't want to say many animals, but one of multiple different animals that have sex for pleasure along with like dolphins and other primates and, and uh, organisms like that. So when you have sex for pleasure, it's still technically rooted in procreation, right? So if you take, take a, a man way back when we had tribes and stuff, he wants to procreate with as many people as possible to further his line because that's that human drive to procreate. A woman needs to procreate before she reaches a certain age in this you know, evolution um, in this basic evolutionary standpoint. Now today, this might manifest itself in somebody having multiple sexual partners or having sex often for pleasure because in their minds, they're still trying to procreate, but, but instead it manifests, manifests itself in excessive sexual activity, excessive desire for pleasure because the basic evolutionary mindset is procreate and the excess becomes pleasure, which becomes sex for pleasure uh, more than is probably healthy. The same way eating a gallon of ice cream in one sitting is not healthy for you, but in the very basic essence of, of our evolutionary needs for survival, you need to consume as many calories as possible whenever you can, because way back when in the state of nature, uh, especially before agriculture, when you're hunting, you never really know when your next meal is going to come because the nature of hunting, obviously, it's not guaranteed that you're going to catch game. Uh, and our bodies, or at least our minds, haven't really caught up to this concept that, that uh, for example, we have agriculture now. We have food pretty much on demand. It still has that scavenger mindset of eating as much as possible. Now, obviously, we're thinking beings, so we can consciously choose not to. But if we just flow with what our body wants, what our body tells us we want, then we're, we're going to eat the whole gallon of ice cream. And, and that's why humans are interesting because we're rational beings in an irrational world. The irrational side of us says, eat the ice cream, have sex as much as possible. But the rational side says, well, moderation is important. And the reason moderation is important is because when you exceed your basic necessities for survival too much, 
you you lead to an excess of pleasure which desensitizes uh your relationship with all these different things right so like video games for example uh, i'm not entirely sure <laughs> what the relationship with video games is to our evolutionary uh drives perhaps if you're playing a video game that's kind of military related you're like an fps like call of duty then it probably is related to our human drive to to engage in combat to to fight for our survival and it's it simulates that so that's perhaps what happens in video games or just in most video games or a lot of video games you're attaining a higher levels you're attaining it's almost like power right in video games you have power you play skyrim you become the most powerful dragonborn with all these different abilities and that i guess ties into an evolutionary drive to power which is something i'm also going to discuss further now i know i've kind of drawn this out and this is definitely going to be a long 10 minute uh philosophy a long 10 minutes i can already see but anyway, so we've established that pleasure becomes the next thing. Now, over time, in these, in these developed countries, in societies that first have met their survival needs, they've met the needs to survive, now they've reached pleasure, and they've meet, meet, met their pleasure needs. We have access to entertainment, we have access to hyper-stimulating substances, you know, video games, um, uh, fast food, uh, <laughs> You know all these different things, and uh, once you reach that, you once you have the these sort of things that give us pleasure, you have all these avenues to attain pleasure. Then you reach the next level, which becomes meaning and power, and how those two are pretty much tied together. And there's only a very slight variation between the two, in my opinion. Meaning and power become the final stage or final tiers of human value and and what really matters. Now, I place meaning below power and I'll get into that, but they're pretty much on the same rung. Now, we look at a hypercapitalist consumer society. Man's meaning becomes tied to the material. It becomes tied to his his identity. Man's identity becomes his economic contribution. It's it's like what's the most common question you ask someone when you first meet them? It's what do you do for a living? Your identity is how you contribute to the economic machine. Therefore, man becomes a cog in this economic machine. Man becomes a means to an end, specifically someone else's end, specifically for another person's economic benefit, which in capitalist, hypercapitalist society, money equals power. Therefore, you, you are working mo oftentimes, um, and that's not always the case. Obviously, you have CEOs and you have business owners, but generally the, the common man, is working for someone else's economic benefit more so than they're working for their own economic benefit and they're helping that individual in their ability to wield and exert power and influence and when i say man i talk about the typical man because ultimately most people are working for someone else most people are not owners of their own companies they're not making their own money they're working for somebody else now man becomes a means to an end a means to somebody else's end this is something that Kant and Heidegger are very critical of. Kant says, famously says, man is a means in himself. And what this means is you shouldn't see people as just tools to further your own agendas, right? And Heidegger delves into this as well. Heidegger was a phenomenologist. He wanted to really emphasize man's connection to nature, Dasein. Dasein basically, you know, meaning being in the, like being, being in the moment. We're all beings, right? And we're connected to different kinds of beings. He saw every single organism as a being. We have a connection to rocks, you know, in nature. And there's there's sort of science to back this up, like uh, to, to increase uh, basic happiness, it, it's important to get a certain level of sunlight, your relationship to sunlight. Um, bare feet on grass actually raises I don't know the specific chemical, but it raises happiness. So you have a you have a innate connection to nature, which makes you happier. Uh, and man, over time, has begun straying away from nature. Uh, in the very basic essence, farming, the agricultural revolution, was man's first step to stray from nature. Um, rather than just taking what he needed, man started to develop more. And and it makes sense for for survival. It's easier to know you have a meal coming. Obviously, sometimes there's droughts, um, weather conditions, but generally agriculture, farming your own food or raising animals is a more effective way to ensure 
uh, food for consumption than hunting. So man starts to go from hunter-gatherer societies to agriculture societies, and now man's starting to exploit nature. And this is Heide something that Heidegger is very critical of, and it's man's exploitation of nature, exploitation of natural resources, seeing nature as something to be bent to be dominated for the benefit of man, uh, the benefit of man usually economically, especially over time. And as you start to see nature as separate from man, then you also start to see other men as separate from other men. And what I mean by that is you start to see men as simply a means to your own end, your economic benefit, your economic gain, your power and men start to be exploited you you know you see slavery for example as an example of this that's a perfect example of man being a means to an end a means to someone else's net end a means to a slave owner's end and obviously in industrialized societies that don't have slavery uh, this relationship is isn't quite as strong but you see you know your average worker who's who's working if you take the stake of how much he's contributing to the company Generally speaking, the owner of the company is reaping more rewards from that labor um, of his own contribution than the contribution of the lowest rung. Now, obviously, business owners, those with power, are always going to benefit more, and that's just natural. That's that's sort of a natural uh, relationship. However, it's important to note that when people start seeing man as simply a means to an economic end, this this sort of strips away people's humanity. Right? Man becomes an, a, a cog in an economic machine. He becomes, man becomes his economic contribution. Uh, and I'll get into why this is a bad thing. And not necessarily a bad thing, because like we said, it's natural, but why this will lead to many dangerous outcomes. Now, one thing I want to note, uh, <clears throat> for those of you who've seen some of my past videos, I talk a lot about, a lot about Carol Quigley, who is a historian who wrote Evolution of Civilizations, my great uncle Brian actually studied under him in Georgetown University. Uh, he talks about how in order to further human innovation in societies, you need two things. Um, you need to, well, one thing really, you need, or two things. You need to have time and you need to have your basic survival needs pretty much uh, cared for. And the reason why is because, so... You need free time to be able to innovate, to think beyond your basic needs. So obviously, if you were farming all day and you had no energy to start researching new means of, of uh, farming, then you're just going to have a flat line in terms of technological advancement. You need free time and free energy to be able to think of new ways to farm. And eventually, new ways to farm can turn into advancements in areas not related to agriculture. Excuse me. So perhaps the wheel, right? The wheel might originally be a function for agriculture but eventually it leads to chariots or way back or way further in the future it leads to vehicles right so ultimately you need free time and you need your basic necessities uh, cared for to be able to have human innovation and i'll get into something later on which is ha which is the relationship between suffering and struggle and human innovation and how that's necessary to further human advancement uh, technologically in ways that don't just aren't just about comfort but are about real advancement. Now, I went into my tier system of human value and I want to talk about how uh, I want to talk about meaning specifically and power. So as we have already discussed, in developed countries, you go from in the very beginning, survival met, survival needs are met, pleasure, pleasure needs met. What's next? Meaning. So take the United States for example. Now that we basically have access to most of the things we need, survival is pretty much met for most Americans. Uh, pleasure is met for most Americans. You have all these accesses to pleasure. So now people are seeking meaning. Now in the past, people would seek meaning most of the time through religion. Uh, in the Western world, is specifically Christianity. Now today, people, and when I say people, I mean the common person, like average person, like the majority of people. Nowadays, now they've gone through from seeking meaning through religion to seeking meaning through political ideology and social movement. Their identity is based upon uh, political beliefs. And for less, what is less common, and I think uh, in, in many ways the highest form of searching for meaning due to its complexity, uh, is philosophy. And that's oftentimes the least traveled route to meaning, which I think is a vast, vast mistake, or a very major mistake 
very great grave mistake. That's the word I'm looking for. And I think more people should really get into philosophy, and I'll get into that soon as well. Now, when it comes to meaning, essentially meaning uh, why we exist, having a reason for existing is a way to come to terms with life's suffering. Life is suffering, no matter where you live in the world. There's a certain level of suffering that you will endure, whether it's physical or mental. And either way, you need something to justify it generally for the average person. And religion in the past was a good way for justifying this. Now, Nietzsche talks about master and slave morality. And I'm going to get into how this relates. So, in the past, we're going to talk about Christianity as slave morality first. So, obviously, Christianity comes from uh, the Jewish religion, and the Hebrew people were oftentimes enslaved by other people. They were enslaved by the pharaohs, by Babylon. Uh, so they have this history of being oppressed. And what slave morality essentially is, it's justifying their suffering by saying, you may suffer now on earth, but eventually you will be rewarded in the afterlife. You will be rewarded with heaven in the afterlife. Therefore, your suffering is justified. And this is called slave morality because this comes from people who are suffering, who, who are being tyrannized by uh, the masters, the people above them. Therefore, their morality is based upon enduring suffering. Now, master morality, on the other hand, is generally, this is, not, this is more of a morality that justifies their seizure of power. Now, a lot of times, master morality or people who, who sort of have master morality will co-opt slave moralities like religion for their own gains. So you take Europe and you know the many wars that were waged on the basis of basis of religion were oftentimes just certain kings that wanted to further their own power, but they justified it through religion. And this is essentially uh, the relationship between leaders and followers. Followers will cling to what gives them meaning. It's whatever empowers them and makes their life feel important, makes their life matter. Their life is not just their suffering. Their suffering means something, right? And religion, like I said, like Christianity, justifies suffering for eternal reward in the afterlife, as well as providing a foundation for their morality. Now, today, uh, political and social movements have seemed to replace religion as not only a foundation for morality, but in empowering the masses to, to sort of, since they have this meaning now, this morality, this political ideology that they deem as completely correct and as what should be, what ought to be, they're going to try to, to uh, spread their their morality onto other people, often forcefully, the same way that religion did, for example, in the many crusades or jihads or other religious wars that were waged throughout history. Now, it's interesting because Nietzsche said that democracy is really just a continuation of Christianity. It becomes the new meaning for many, many people, right? And and when I say democracy, this essentially is related to political and social movements because within democracies, that's when you start to get all these different political and social movements. This goes all the way back to the Enlightenment and all the ideas that came out of that. But essentially, democracy, all these political and social movements, that becomes the new meaning for many people. And with it, the ideals and morality oftentimes of a liberal democracy, which are really a continuation of Christianity, which I said, uh, before, which is a mixture of Greek ethics and the old uh, Hebrew scriptures, and advocates for the equality of all men. All men are created equal in the eyes of God, right? And this is the relationship with religion. Now, in a democracy, uh, all men are created equal in the eyes of the state. Now, obviously, in the past, this hasn't always been implemented, but that's the basic fundamental tenet. And for the most part, uh, I won't say it successfully done today, but it, it's it's a lot it's done a lot better than in the past. Um, so, uh, ultimately, political ideology, social movements, democracy, government have mostly replaced religion in giving people meaning, generally, right? Now, leaders, on the other hand, are individuals who do one of the following. They either benefit from, from uh, the sort of status quo. They benefit from, for example, the systems that are already in place, the beliefs and ideas that are here now. So in the past, that might meant, might have meant manipulating religion to, to, per, to have a holy war, for example, to expand their kingdom or empire. Um, today, it could be popular social movements to further their own interests, right? So people, if they feel that, um, off the top of my head, let's, let's think about 
the military industrial complex, for example. Um, so the military industrial complex essentially uh, is a lobby um, that that wants to sell weapons. They want to sell uh, different types of military vehicles, uh, airplanes, so like fighter jets, tanks, etc. What they might do, and this is an example today, if you take the Ukraine war, for example, right? Um, regardless of what you believe, whether you support United States intervention or not, um, what can't be denied is that it benefits the military industrial complex. So they'll, they'll, their lobby will flow in support to uh, pro-intervention, pro-U.S. intervention into the Ukraine war. The military industrial complex lobby will advocate for the war as just um, defending the Ukrainian people, right? And obviously, you know, Ukraine's defending itself from a foreign power that's much, that's much stronger than they are. So it's certainly, um, it's, it's a very noble cause for them to be defending themselves. But then the military industrial complex doesn't really care whether it's a noble cause or not. They just want to make money. But they're going to they're going to co-opt this idea that it's a noble and defensive uh, war, which I mean it is for the Ukrainian people. But for the military industrial complex, it's just about making money. So they're going to get this social movement of like defend Ukraine, um, and they're going to use this to their own advantage as leaders. They're going to get the followers to support the war thinking they're doing something right, and they probably have good intentions. I'm sure the majority of people, the common person, has good intentions, but the intentions of the military-industrial complex, whether this ends up being a good thing or a bad thing in the long run, they just want to make money. They want to further their own interests by co-opting a specific idea, a specific belief that's widely spread out or, or among the people. Now, um, the real interesting leader and the kind of leader I think Nietzsche would really get behind is the kind of person who decides to create their own meaning and introduce new ideas. Now, we talk about man's search for meaning, how people define themselves through political and social movements. The political and social movements that are co-opted by those in power right now ultimately are, in my opinion, are, are not going to stand the test of time because people people are restless. Man, in his essence, is restless. He desires more. He wants to pursue something new and different from what's currently widely accepted. Societal norms and customs are things that they want to change because ultimately man, as we describe through the will to power, through societies that grow more and more decadent, that have more and more pleasure and comfort and seek greater meaning, they want to change what's currently in place now. So when leaders create new ideas, oftentimes these new ideas will replace uh, old ideas and ideologies and ultimately prevail in the end, which is why this thing, all this that I've been talking about is related to materialism and consumer societies and how these, these sort of uh, civilizations and decay that have met survival, they have met pleasure, and now they are searching for meaning will ultimately crumble and not necessarily lose in the end, but they're going to change like the sort of the people that the sort of um, widely accepted beliefs that were currently or originally in place in that civilization will ultimately be replaced by something new. And it's this inevitability that I talk about. I always talk about that about the inevitability of collective groups overpowering another collective group and why in this particular video, I'm discussing how this is a direct result of the effects of materialism in consumer societies, or materialism in societies and consumerism in societies. And the, the example I'm going to provide today is, is from Fight Club. And um, I think you guys are really going to find this interesting. At least I hope that you do. Now, I'm going to pull up some notes. So Fight Club. <clears throat> the narrator in Fight Club can't sleep. Now, he's, this is an individual who perfectly, at least in the beginning of the movie, encapsulates Nietzsche's last man. Someone who's constantly seeking desire and pleasure and comfort. Comfort, specifically. Stick with that. Uh, They're constantly seeking that, and they are conforming to how society expects them to be. You know, uh, the narrator says everything's a copy of a copy of a copy. A copy. When deep space exploration takes place, um, all the new planets and galaxies are going to be named after the corporations. It was like Microsoft Galaxy, Planet Starbucks, all that stuff. And it's essentially disenfranchisement with a consumer society, a materialistic society where everything is defined by the material. 
their identity is defined by what they own and it's defined by how they contribute to to consumption what they contribute to be consumed by consumed by um, other individuals in this society in this economic machine so essentially this relates to to uh, he, he's a slave to consumerism and materialism so he's upset like for example he's obsessed with building the perfect home he talks about it. he like scrolls through catalogs trying to find what dining set defines me as a person right um, he's constantly looking to build the perfect home the perfect collection of materials and that's how he's defined um, and that's what meaning is in a hyper capitalist world the idea of success is how many how many materials you have a big house a nice car um, that becomes the how you display your success in a hyper capitalist uh, society but through this all they still are trying to appeal to authenticity they talk about the imperfect plates made by the indigenous peoples of wherever right um, ultimately there is a void left by all this he does not the man does not feel he does not feel meaning real meaning uh, embedded in this material world in this hyper capitalist world he does not find meaning in being defined by his economic contribution and his economic successes because ultimately the materials are economic successes he does not feel fulfilled um, and it goes back to suffering because like i said the reason why the person in the developing country is more happy is because they are dealing with the very basic level survival needs they are suffering but on a physical level because they have a very clear mission so the narrator starts to seek suffering to a certain degree he starts to go to support groups for individuals with testicular cancer and this is interesting it's uh i think the the analogy there with testicular cancer can uh, cancer it literally um i think relates to to sort of the death of masculinity or at least the decline of masculinity these are individuals who literally don't have their testicles anymore it's almost like they are no longer men and that's an analogy at least that they're trying to get at so it's sort of talking about how in a materialistic consumer society where the basic needs for survival are not met men also sort of lose meaning because a man's meaning is a guardian a protector right in, in the state of nature where warfare is constant and in this society without suffering with comfort then man literal man now, i've been saying man throughout this video to describe just humans in general but in this case actual men lose meaning because they're sitting nine to five jobs they're not being physically uh, they're not extenuating themselves physically they're not doing what they were meant built to be doing and this creates a big void a void of meaning so the uh, the, uh, the narrator seeks suffering he seeks suffering by seeing individuals who who are doing much worse than him um, to make him feel at peace because then he could say well my life is good because i see these people suffering it makes him feel authentic because i mean they see him and they think he's also suffering with them so he's almost like he's 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 taking a vacation as he says he's taking a vacation into suffering he's putting himself in their shoes for a little bit and in some ways i think this relates to the one short story uh it's called the one who walks away from amelos now amelos is this idealistic utopian society where everybody is involved in debauchery, uh, excessive forms of pleasure. It's a very Epicurean, hedonistic society. People are having massive orgies everywhere, you know, doing drugs, uh, drinking alcohol, etc. But the whole basis for their society depends upon the suffering of one innocent individual. Alone in a little room, somewhere in Amalas, is a little girl who's, who's trapped inside a dark room. And she's thrown food every once in a while but you know she's trapped in this room imagine the psychological impacts of being a little girl who grows up in a dark room she is suffering every day so badly and this you know this idea everyone else in Amalas lives in pleasure because they know that one person is suffering they know someone's doing worse than them so someone is taking upon all the suffering of the world and there's i think there's christian undertones with this as well the idea that christ has come to to uh, allow us you know to forgive us of our original sin and and Christ being this this redemption right someone taking upon the sins of the world so there's sort of Christian undertones to that as well um, he he you know you you think about Christ um, going through stages of the cross um, carrying the cross being beaten by Roman soldiers wearing the crown of thorns 
experiencing great suffering for for the people for for everyone's sins right um it's a similar kind of concept with the one who walks away from omelas and it's called the one who walks away from omelas because eventually certain people leave because they realize the the inequality of this society that one person is suffering while everyone else is living the way they are and i think this sort of relates to the matrix a little bit because it's the idea of you escape the matrix you escape this fake world which which is, is is not the correct world it's not the real world and you escape it and you leave it behind you leave all the pleasure and the comfort behind for true meaning and i'll go back to my matrix analogy a little bit later as well but um so the narrator once he sees uh marla singer another individual who comes there to to sort of do the same thing he's doing he starts to see his own it reflects his own hypocrisy and he sees a bit of himself in her he sees his inauthenticity and that sort of shifts this this thing that goes on in his head now uh when the narrator meets tyler durden who is, is also one of the main characters of the film uh Tyler Durden asked, you know, he, he asked Tyler Durden, what, do he, what does he do for a living? And this sort of reflects this idea that we are our economic contribution to an economic machine. We are a cog in the economic machine. And Tyler Durden says something along the lines of what? So you can pretend you're interested. Now, Tyler Durden is everything the narrator isn't but wants to be. Tyler Durden doesn't care about material things. Um, he steals a lot of the things that he needs. He lives in a decrepit old house. He, 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 he like pisses on conformity. He pisses on normality. He's almost like Diogenes from um, ancient Greece. And I've, to I've told the story of Diogenes multiple times, but I'll do it one more time. Uh, Diogenes was a vagrant philosopher. He was homeless. He lived in a literal bathtub. And he's famous for uh, Alexander the Great uh, coming upon him and um, standing in front of him and saying... Uh, Diogenes, is there anything I can do for you? Because he really admired Diogenes because Diogenes did not care about anything. He'd walk around purposely trying to embarrass people, walking around nude, walking around like spitting upon customs and how we're expected to act. And when Alexander asks, you know, is there anything I can do for you? Diogenes says, move aside, you're blocking my son. And Alexander says, if there were anyone in the world I could be but Alexander, I would be Diogenes. And Diogenes said, if there was anyone I had to be in the world besides Diogenes, I would also want to be Diogenes. And, you know, Di Tyler Durden, I think, is, a, is sort of a reflection of Diogenes, someone who's spitting on societal norms, who rejects what, what society generally accepts. Um, he rejects materialism. He reje rejects consumerism. Now, Tyler Durden and the narrator create Fight Club, a place where men feel like men because they're fighting each other. That's the survival, basic survival instinct. To, to, to fight, to be warlike. And they're getting all that excess energy out. And they're starting to feel meaning in that. And it sort of devolves into anarchy and terrorism. And ultimately what it is, is you have these followers, these people who are seeking meaning, and they find meaning in these meaning in this anar you know, Project Mayhem, which is a terrorist anar anarchical movement trying to destabilize um, modern society, um, rejecting materialism rejecting consumerism and just destroy all these symbols of of a hyper capitalist world you know in the end they blow up a bunch of credit card company uh buildings um so essentially what this is is you have the followers which are the members of project mayhem who who want to find meaning and tyler durden is co-op he's not co-opting he's creating new meaning he's creating this new movement and ultimately, that's what people turn to because they don't want to go with what's widely accepted. They want to find new ideas that go completely against the society that they've grown tired of, that they've grown grown disenfranchised with, and they will move on to this new idea. So Tyler Durden sort of represents that. And I think that you see a little bit of that today. You see these popular movements which empower the common man. They empower them by making them feel important, giving them meaning. So you see a lot of social movements um, for example, and these are generally co-opted by people in power now, so they're not necessarily new, a lot of them. A lot of them are sort of part of what's widely accepted, but um, they give people meaning. They make people feel like they're doing something right, that their life has meaning. Um, it gives them a foundation for their morality. It makes them feel like they're making a difference in the world. They're being empowered by this group, but what I think eventually replaces that is the idea of Tyler Durden the ubermensch kind of character. Someone who comes in and completely flips society on its head and provides ideas that 
are completely, or not maybe not completely, but very, very uh, opposing to what's currently widely accepted. And because people are disenfranchised with how things are now, because they've grown desensitized to pleasure and they're seeking meaning, they often will pick the meaning that is not accepted by the establishment, that is new and that is and that is uh, innovative and completely different. So, you know, you, you talk about why people follow Andrew Tate, for example, um, despite the fact that there's a lot of things that that uh, people obviously disagree with him, uh, myself included. But I understand why men are drawn to him, and he's this figure who basically squanders all of these, or not all, but a lot of um, societal norms and spits on them and says, you know. Uh, he, he provides this alternative to modern living. That's why a lot of people uh, have, have sort of been drawn to him. And, you know, my criticism of him uh, is, is a lot to do with his hedonism and his hypercapitalism. Um, so I obviously, you know, I, I'm, I don't like him really. I mean, I don't hate the guy, but I don't like him at all. And I don't think his message is right. But I do think it's interesting. And I think it is a good sign that people... Um, maybe not a good sign. Okay. Not a good sign, but it is interesting. It's see, I always like when things change because it creates the ability for something better to replace it. Now in his case, right? I don't agree with him, but what I have seen is it's showing that people once again, as I predicted, are willing to, we're not willing, but they want something different. They want something that's not accepted by, um, the wider society, the establishment. They want to to adopt new ideas. So what this tells me, and the reason why this could be a good thing, this could also be a bad thing. The reason this could be a good thing is because you could replace what's bad about society now with something better. Now the problem is people can be drawn to men like Andrew Tate or men like, you take popular movements of the, of the past like Nazism or Bolshevism. Um, they could be, you know, they can be drawn to those types of movements in which you have mass genocide um, you can have very bad people or bad groups come up with new ideas and receive the support of all these disenfranchised people who are dissatisfied with life and society as it is now. But it could also be a very interesting and good thing because if you can replace what currently exists now with something better, then that is what I'm excited about. If what exists now can be replaced with something better because people are willing to or not willing, they need change. They're dissatisfied with things now. And if you could pr provide the right path forward, then ultimately it could be a good thing. But as I've said before, with popular movements, people don't necessarily support what's right. They support what empowers them and they support individuals that are powerful. So people like Hitler, for example, people felt empowered by him. Um, so they supported him. And then he used that power to commit mass genocide, to you know, mass genocide of uh, Jews, gypsies, this um, enslavement of the Slavs. So you, you have these very negative things that can happen when you have disenfranchised people, especially disenfranchised young men seeking meaning no matter where it comes from, even if it comes in the form of genocidal regimes um, like, like Stalin's regime, for example. Well, a better example would be uh, Mao Zedong, I think, because Stalin didn't start the Bolshevik revolution. It was more Lenin, right? But it's this idea that popular movements feed on the disenfranchisement and dissatisfaction of the common man and turn it into their own power. And that's the relationship between followers and leaders that I've been talking about. Followers in a materialistic consumer hyper-capitalist society are unsatisfied with being identified by their economic contribution. This is something I've mentioned before that Hannah Arendt talks about of why it's the banality of evil. Why do people start to support people like the Nazis? Well, the Nazis gave them meaning that wasn't based on their economic contribution. Now it became economic, no, it became contribution to the state, contribution to this idea of pan-Germanism for a world Germanic order, um, for, for actual the nation itself, the German identity. It became something separate from the economic so people could look and say, this is the idea I'm striving towards. This is what I'm supporting. And they can really see, I mean, seeing ideas. I don't know what I'm trying to say there. Not see ideas, but they can they can actually identify the idea that they're fighting for. Whereas in an economics, you know, society run by economic contribution, um, by, by economic success, by being defined by the material, there's no clear idea that you're striving towards. It's just like becoming rich. 
right? But not everyone can be a part of the 1%. Only 1% can be a part of the 1%. But in collectivist societies, communist societies, fascist societies, the whole state becomes the product of each individual in the collective group. Therefore, they receive meaning that's separate um, from just them. And it, and it is possible for everyone in society to be a part of, for the most part, apart from, well, in Nazi society, obviously, certain ethnic minorities and religious minorities. In Bolshevik society, it was the bourgeois. So, you know, obviously, uh, not everyone. But generally speaking, the mass population is empowered by the state because their success is the state's success. And that's why it's very appealing. Popular movements are very appealing to the masses because in an economic in a nation like the United States, for example, um, not everyone can be a part of the 1%. Therefore, not everyone can see economic success. Therefore, not everyone benefits necessarily from the system in place. And obviously, um, as you've seen in Bolshevik countries and then the defeat of fascist countries in World War II, they also lead to defeat. But um, for a long time, they're able to really get the people behind this idea because the idea is clear and even if they lose in the end, at, at the very beginning, they have this idea of the state success is their success. And it's a lot easier to show the people than uh, you can achieve economic success, right? Because we all have the ability to get into the 1%, but not all of us can be in the 1% because of math, you know, which is, which is I think, one of the, the uh, downfalls of materialistic consumer hypercapitalist societies that grow epicurean, that grow comfortable. They start to seek deeper meaning. They realize that they can't find deeper meaning in the, the sort of um, liberal capitalist democracies um, where economic contribution is your identity, uh, where political capital is really economic capital, where the power belongs to those with wealth, right? And this is one of the issues that I think needs to be tackled. And why I say that um, this, this sort of, this, this, this repeat of history, history repeats itself because of human nature, um, and that can be a good thing if you can replace what exists now with something good, but oftentimes it gets replaced with something bad and something harmful. Now, um, as I'm getting to the end of this, I just want to get into more of the potential ramifications of what's happening today. I, I often like to compare Rome to the United States in two ways. First of all, Rome started off as a republic, much like the United States, but through corruption, um, through, Democrat, through corruption in the democratic process, they eventually became a dictatorship uh, under Julius Caesar and then an empire. So what you see is over time, democratic societies due to you know, an increase of, of uh, corruption within society, economic capital becoming political capital, um, you see a replacement of a democratic state with an autocratic state. Um, so like, for example, the Nazi Germany was a republic before um, the Nazis came to power. Rome was a republic before Rome became an empire. So you start to see these, these potentially authoritarian movements within the United States. And it, it's sort of this thing that you see time and time again in history. With the French Revolution as well, um, you have the French Revolution. What happens right afterwards? Napoleon comes into power and he creates the French Empire. So it's this history repeats itself. A lot of times, pretty much all the time, democracies will go back to being autocracies. So when you try to predict what might happen in America... That's certainly one of the options that could happen. We sort of have this idea that democracy is something that can't be touched, um, that it's something that is stable and will exist, but it's not necessarily the case, and that's something that we have to pay attention to. Um, especially if you want to maintain a democracy, you have to look at the real threats to democracy. And I think the biggest threat to, hum to democracy is just human nature. I think human nature is such that democracies will turn into autocracies, and people in autocracies will grow tired of being oppressed um, by autocrats and the oligarchies, and then eventually they become democracies again. So you kind of have this revolution, this repeat of history, and it makes you think, is there anything that really can stand the test of time? And I guess that's what we try to answer with philosophy, political ideologies, and maybe one day it'll be answered, maybe it won't. But we'll see. Either way, the second comparison I want to make with Rome is the destruction of Rome, the fall of Roman civilization as an empire. So whether America stays a democracy or not, it could still fall and the way it could fall is because as societies grow defined by the material, they grow weak, they grow comfortable. Um, Roman, Rome's biggest issue was, or one of Rome's major issues, was that aside from the fact that 
early on their ec their economic success came from conquest and once you get too big you can't really expand anymore so you, you stop having conquest you stop having economic success but another issue is that less people wanted to join the roman military because the population the actual roman population in italy italia uh grew decadent they grew comfortable they no longer had that game in them to fight to to join the military so they were they were comfortable they're living very epicurean lifestyles um, especially the upper classes of Rome, they lived debaucherous lifestyles, hedonistic, crazy parties, drinking all the time. And if you have too much of that in a society, you have less people willing to do the dirty work to ensure the survival and the power of the state. Therefore, less people in the military means that, and in the case of Rome, Germanic tribes came in and invaded, and you know other different uh, groups and kingdoms eventually led to the destruction of the Western Roman Empire. And this is a direct result of society growing weak, growing decadent, growing too comfortable with comforts, too comfortable with pleasure, feeling entitled to pleasure. People nowadays feel so entitled to pleasure, they don't realize that this sort of moral degeneracy is creating weakness in society because we become so fixed with wanting pleasure and desiring things, hyper-stimulating things. Look at our diet and our lifestyle. Sugar consumption has gone up like so much for for the past in the past hundred years um and, and you know, we, we consume so much more sugar than we did in the past so that's our diet our diet is worse if our diet's worse we're weaker our lifestyle a lot of people work nine to five office jobs in the past you had labor intensive jobs which more or less fulfilled your 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 necessity for physical activity now you have to work out oftentimes because your job isn't physically intensive so people you know, United States has a major obesity problem. That equals weakness. That means weakness. So um, you have all these things contributing to weakness, which could lead to another society, a stronger society, in this case, China, for example, which, you know, they're starting to become, uh, they, they, have a, they have a growing upper middle class as well. But generally speaking, people there live in much higher levels of suffering and, and fulfilling basic needs than we do. They have a lot less commodities than we do. Therefore, they have that game in them and potentially could be an adversary that prevails over us because of our own weakness in our society. Now, I think what America is, is, and I, and I said I'm going to go back to the allegorical matrix, right? The allegorical matrix is that once you get into this pattern of wanting to constantly desiring more things and being fixed with comfort, you can't break out of that. You can't leave Amalas. You're stuck in Amalas. You're stuck in Amalas because... You're fine with the fact that people in the United States are still suffering. You're fine with the fact that our comforts and the things that we we benefit from come at the expense of people in developing countries. Their resources are exploited. They're not receiving as much as we are from the resources being exploited. Look at the Democratic Republic of Congo. They have some of the largest lithium battery uh, or the lithium deposits in the world yet the congo is 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 a completely destitute country they're completely poor they don't have any infrastructure and then look at us we're receiving our nice little iphones right so we're exploiting their labor and their resources um and that's essentially what's what's happening right we are benefiting from someone else's suffering this is the matrix um we're all contributing somehow to this economic machine where specific people are benefiting far more than others it's just like the matrix the ai in the matrix is draining the life force out of people using them as batteries the same way we're being used as batteries for this economic machine we're being used as batteries our labor is being used to contribute to to someone else's benefit not this wider meaning and because of this you're going to see people that that advocate for deeper meanings be successful people that say well you aren't your economic success you're not your fucking nikes uh -huh, right um it's like you know tyler Durden says the things you own end up owning you that's what happens you end up being defined by your economic successes by your material possessions and that's what happens in materialistic consumer societies and when you have these popular movements that advocate for deeper meaning that are separate from this this sort of economic identity um like when you take communism fascism or, or any of these other populist movements they gain traction because people start to seek meaning when they're no longer satisfied with you know survival's met pleasure's met now how do you meet meaning right uh, they're no longer uh, satisfied with being a means to another person's economic end they're all right contributing their labor to something but they want to contribute to their labor to something they feel a part of um you know the state in in, in these authoritarian movements or 
uh, whatever else you know there ends up being. Um, so this is the matrix in the sense that you're stuck in this economic machine that you're contributing to, but you don't really think like most people don't think about, they're not self-aware and questioning their existence. They just kind of do what they're expected to do. They go through high school and they go to college, they get a job, they have kids, you know, have a family. Boom. That's what they, they're told to do. Therefore they do it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but you should at least wonder why you're doing it. It's like Nietzsche says, Nietzsche says, you must slay the dragon thou shalt and that's essentially what this is thou shalt is is the idea that you're expected to do certain things um you know nietzsche is really morpheus in a lot of ways when you think about it so we start our lives as the camel the person who accepts things as they are we go through high school we go to college we get a job now, i didn't do that but most people or not most people even but a lot of people that's what you're expected to do and thou shalt is thou shalt go to high school go to college get a job etc. Pay off your student loans. Now you become the lion who, who slays the dragon thou shalt. You fight the dragon thou shalt. In my case, I decided I didn't want to go to college yet. I'll go later, but not right out of high school. So you got to slay the dragon thou shalt. You have to question these, these commonly accepted beliefs, these commonly accepted ways of living your life. Slay the dragon thou shalt. And then afterwards, you become the child again. So in my case, I like to think of it as I will go to college, but on my own terms after I'm done with what I'm doing now. Um, I'm going to go to college on my own terms. Uh, and that's, that's the child and the child in Nietzsche's ways, you, you will, you will, you know, you don't have, it's not just about creating new ideas, but it's about accepting old ideas too, but you're accepting them with the self-awareness that you don't have to accept them. You're accepting them because you believe it is right. That's kind of my relationship with Christianity. I'm not a Christian because my parents or my mom is Christian, or because I went to a Catholic school, I'm a Christian because I choose to, independent of what's expected of me. Um, and that's, that's, that's how it ends up needing to be, like escaping the matrix is slaying the dragon thou shalt, and coming up with your own beliefs that you, don't, that you have, not just because someone else forced it upon you growing up, not just because you're expected to think that way, but because you really have thought about it. You've looked at all the different options and you've decided this is the way I'm going to choose to live my life. This is what I'm going to believe in. And that's finally escaping this, 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 this matrix of the mind, this mind matrix, this sort of herd mentality of accepting what's widely accepted, believing what's widely believed. And, and really, and this is the, you know, this is kind of what happens with materialistic consumer societies. You have this revolution, people seek meaning after all these basic things have been met. And this is, that's the person seeking to escape the matrix. Now, often they just end up in a different matrix, which is like your fascist movements, your communist movements, etc. But once in a while, and sometimes it's the leader of these movements who, who just seek to empower themselves. But eventually, sometimes you'll get someone who really comes up with something new. And it's, it's always the leader, right? And, you know, he's supported by followers. You need leaders and followers. It's necessary. But you hope that one day someone comes up with an idea that is completely new and revolutionary and really does something that furthers human innovation, hurt, furthers human cultural advancement, technological advancement, something new that is truly good. And all good things come to an end. All pure things are corrupted. But for that moment, it's pure and beautiful and it turns into something great. And, and that's what you hope happens in this cycle. You hope this cycle every now and again you have something good that comes out of it, not just these bad things. And sometimes bad things lead to good things as well. But, you know, that's just this revolution. I think I'll revisit this topic in the future. This ended up being a lot longer than uh, I expected it to be. But like I said, the issue with materialistic and consumer societies is that with an excess of comfort, Epicurean lifestyles, without suffering and struggle, we will fail to further human innovation. Because ultimately, human innovation comes from fulfilling these these uh, comes from from solving the issues of suffering and struggle. If I'm not creating, you know, if I'm not, um, you take medicine, for example, people are dying of these diseases, that's struggle, that's suffering. So you come up with these medicines to cure those diseases. Bad things are what lead to human innovation. So when you end up in these societies that for the most part have most um, sufferings solved, then you fail to have real human innovation, both culturally and technologically, and then the innovations that do happen end up being innovations that further human consumption. It's like I say, uh, in, in sort of hyper-capitalist societies, 
you no longer express yourself by how you create, how you innovate, but how you consume. So all these new, most of the time, a lot of these new uh, human innovations are, are just a means to, to contribute to human consumption. So like Facebook, for example, does Facebook really add anything to human advancement or does it really just provide something to be consumed? Right. Um, and that's the issue, I think, is that human innovation, when you reach this point, becomes about innovating to human consumption rather than creating a new spaceship, for example, that's going to reach Mars or whatever. Right. That's why I consider human innovation something that does what humans have never done before. And it doesn't just provide a niche in which someone wants to consume something and they consume it better. It gives them more pleasure. I think true human innovation isn't about fixing pleasures, but about really doing something that has never been done before building creating building blocks that eventually lead to human singularity that reach a point where we're advancing so fast that we basically accomplish everything that we could possibly accomplish like it's it become, eventually becomes we're moving at infinity times up technologically right that's that's the end state right singularity exponential growth eventually just goes up um that's that's the end state and that's kind of what i think real human innovation and advancement are is getting towards closer to the end state. Does Facebook really do that? I don't think so. Do, do things that are good for consumption really do that? Most of the time they don't. Um, and I think that's why ultimately materialistic consumer societies lead to the downfall of civilizations, whether that means the downfall as they're replaced with a different form of government or they're overtaken by another civilization. Ultimately, these, these, these societies that grow weak and decadent will eventually fall, in my opinion. Now, I think this is what makes philosophy perhaps the highest form of meaning for me because it's the most complex to understand. Um, it really makes up the backbone of everything from religion, to political ideologies, morals, and ethics. So if you can really understand the building blocks, the foundations of what you believe in and why you believe that way, then you can really reach, you know, you're never going to reach complete absolute truth because there really isn't really absolute truth, but you get closer to that. You get closer to finding out the way to live your life that is probably the best. You find the best, most ideal imperfection, right? It's like we're seeking perfection even though we'll never reach it. And that's why philosophy is so important because political ideologies that claim to be the tell-all be-all, that claim to be the answer to everything, end up often not being the answer to everything and often end up oppress being incredibly oppressive, uh, leading to great you know genocides, for example, whether it's communism or Nazism. You have these things that claim to be the answer to everything, political ideologies, which are very basic. They're really just tools. You have them claiming to answer everything and they end up creating a lot of hardship and destruction. Whereas philosophy, um, while it could certainly cause destruction, it's a lot more difficult because philosophy itself is very complex. You look at the philosophy of Nietzsche, it can really be interpreted so many different ways. So while you can interpret things wrong or you can interpret things even right a certain way and, and it can lead to devastation, the actual philosophy itself if taken with with nuance and a grain of salt can often i think dissuade people from thinking too much in one way and thinking too much in one way that could lead to uh, negative consequences and i think you know that's what makes philosophy so beautiful is that it really is the building block of all those different things i mentioned religion politics morals ethics and that's that's what it's really the backbone uh, the understanding of the backbone of why we do or believe anything. And that's why philosophy is so beautiful. As Seneca says, philosophy is what brings us closer to the gods. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's something I certainly uh, believe in is that philosophy is the, is, is, is one of the things that you really need to explore to answer these questions. Um, just really quick before I end up with this or end this video. Uh, in my last video, one thing I wanted to say that I didn't, I, I might have forgot, I don't know, I might have said it. There's this great quote about mortality, um, a great quote about mortality in, in Troy. And I wanna pull it up really quick because I don't think I got a chance to say it in my last video. Um, it's a great quote. Let's see. All right, so this is a quote from, by Achilles in, in the movie Troy. He says, the gods envy us. They envy us because we're mortal, because any moment may be our last. Everything is more beautiful because we're doomed. You will never be lovely, lovelier than you are now. 
we will never be here again. And I love that quote. I really wanted to talk, say that quote in my last video because I think it perfectly encapsulates what I was saying about the beauty of potential nothingness after death. death. The possibility that there's nothing after this is death is what makes life so beautiful. The idea that we're only a sliver of infinite time that's what makes life so beautiful and these little moments that we're given these little these little these little exchanges of energy that we can be a part of that's what makes life so beautiful that we can actually be a part of it and that it could be gone just like that and that's why you have to love life you have to love what you've been given the gift you've given you've been given that's easier said than done obviously but it is truly a beautiful gift we've been given whether it's a god-given gift or some accident Despite the fact that we're just Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill for no reason, we get the chance to push the boulder. We get the chance to breathe air and think and, and rationalize. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's, that's worth all the suffering, I think. And, um, you know, anyway, I'll probably revisit, revi like I said, revisit this concept again. I just really want to say, just to end this, consumer societies create Nietzsche's last man. Once survival's met and pleasure's met, the last man accepts things as they are. They seek more pleasure. They, you know, they don't really concern themselves with creating new ideas or creating meaning. They just accept what's widely accepted, the last man. Um, you can either end up being the last man or you can end up being the ubermensch, someone who creates new values, who creates new ideas, and who furthers human innovation. And uh, I definitely went really long with this. Uh, if you listen all the way to this point, let me know in the comments because I will be very impressed. I will be very, very impressed and I will give you a thumbs up. <laughs> if you had the patience to stick through this whole thing, I'm beyond impressed. But anyway, um, thank you guys for watching. If you watched this long, uh, I love this topic. I want to go back to it in the future and I probably will. But anyway, uh, yeah, thank you uh, for letting me do this. Um, I probably wouldn't do this if... If it wasn't for you guys, because even though there's not a ton of people, like I know like a lot of people watch the uh, Dakota video and that's where most people come from and a lot of people don't really watch the other videos, but just the fact that there's some of you that watch these and potentially get something out of it, that's the reason I do it. The reason I do it, I could just study all these things. Now granted, this does help me too because by teaching it, it helps me learn it better too because I start to think of things I wouldn't have thought of originally. So it helps me too, I'm not going to lie. So I also do it for myself, but I, I do... I am motivated to do it because of you guys, because I'm motivated to say, okay, well, maybe I can have a slight difference in someone else's life, regardless of all the good or bad I've done in my own. I can have some influence on someone, and hopefully it's a good one. And that's what motivates me to do this. And then in doing this, I end up benefiting myself because I start to learn more and realize these things I didn't realize initially. But anyway, I'm going on too long. You want to go to sleep probably, or wake up, or go to work. So. I'm just going to end it here, but uh, I love you guys, and, and uh, thank you for all the support. And yeah, this is the Warrior Philosopher building the foundations of the Warrior Philosophy. I'll see you next time.